how to cook a perfect turkey, and other holiday hints, secrets, and shortcuts. And a perfect turkey to me not just only looks good, but it has to taste good too. So here we go. We have uh, as a turkey. That's the size I like. It's a typical turkey of 18 to 22 pound size. I don't like it in the, the gigantuan uh, ones that are 25 pounds plus if I, if I don't have to, uh, just mainly because they're uh, too hard to handle. And if you're going to get frozen ones, then just go ahead and make sure you defrost it naturally in the refrigerator, three to four days in the refrigerator. First of all, I love to brine my turkeys. And this is a simple uh, formula that I came up with. Um, it's uh, a cup of kosher salt, and I like kosher salt as well. You can use sea salt too. Uh, light brown sugar adds a little sweetness in the background. When I mention clean water, of course, that's the 9.5 pH Kangen water. And then the spices that I put in there, I'm putting in simple stuff like peppercorns and bay leaf and allspice. You can go ahead and customize your flavors of what you have, depending on what flavor profile you would like. I did one year, I did it uh, with uh, chipotle pepper, and boy, that added a nice zing to it. But that was the outcome that I wanted, something a little bit more south, uh, south of the border kind of a taste. Now, let's see. When you bring all these together, you have the, the sugar, the salt, the clean water, and the spices. You bring it all together, bring it to a boil, and then once the spices, or I should say the salt and the sugar is dissolved, then you want to start cooling it off. I usually am never, I'm always in a hurry, so I used to go ahead and add another gallon of clean ice water to, to that to cool it down right away. This is what it looks like when it's, when it's beginning of the after it's been cooled down and I lower my turkey into the brine and I usually use one of those uh, five gallon buckets that fits I have a spare refrigerator in the back that I adjust the shelves so it fits perfectly for a five gallon bucket obviously there's there's no uh, there's no things in the back like beer chilling down so you have to take that out first that's what it looks like submerged you want to have that whole bird submerged into the into the brine so the whole bird gets a chance to, uh, to brine over, overnight. Usually I like 12 hours. That's usually the, the best time to do it. Then what you do is you take it out of the brine, pat it dry, and this is what it looks like when it's ready to go into the oven. When you roast the bird, I know they have all those deep pans that they use for roasting birds. I don't like those deep pans. I like having a pan that you see right there, a regular sheet pan, and I like to fill my, my bird with just a few things like onion, celery, thyme, and rosemary. And I get the thyme and rosemary from my garden. Now, you don't have to, if you don't have a garden, that's okay. But I like the fresh thyme and fresh rosemary for the bird. It gives that, that, that real uh, just very herbaceous smell and uh, flavor. Now, you want to put those inside the bird. You don't need the salt. You've already put the bird in a brine. So you don't need to put, add any more salt to this. So you're ready to go. I sometimes put a little light uh, coating of uh, olive oil or just uh, even just vegetable oil over the bird, just rubbing it down. And then sometimes I'll put some sliced, really thin, like quarter inch sliced vegetables underneath the bird, like uh, celery, carrots, and onions. So it's, it's, it's really simple. So when it goes in the oven, you see it just the way it is right now, of course, without that glass uh, bowl there, but it exposes the whole bird and it actually incre it increases the cook, uh, the, or I should say it decreases the cooking time dramatically. So start off the oven, 500 degrees, preheated. Then you put your bird in there for 30 minutes. I know that's really hot, but trust me, this is what comes out really nice, nice crispy brown skin, just like you see in that picture. As soon as you put it in the oven, you time it 30 minutes, turn it down to 350 degrees, and then check it in an hour and 45 minutes. Now, when you check it, you want to have an instant read thermometer. And an instant read thermometer is like this, where when you put it in, it registers 165 degrees in the thickest part of the thigh. Not the breast, but the thigh. 
I know those butterball turkeys like to put their thermometer in the in the uh, the turkey breast, but that cooks much quicker than the thigh, and you don't want to hit bone. You want to keep it away from bone, but the thickest part, the meatiest part. Now, if you don't happen to have it, like say you lost it, and you, but you have like a skewer, stick a skewer in the thickest part of the thigh and push on it a little bit and watch and see if the, if the uh, juices run clear. That also is a great indicator that your, your bird is ready to be taken out of the oven. Then what you do is you want to rest your turkey. This is extremely important. I can't tell you how many times I've gone over someone's house and the bird is just coming out of the oven, hyping hot, but what happens is you cut into it and all the juices go on your platter, not staying in your bird. So let it rest. What you do is you tent a little foil, you put it over the bird just to keep it warm, but, but not crimped around it. Then you let it rest for 30 minutes, and then when you're ready, present the whole bird as it is and carve it in the kitchen. Unless you're a professional, you've done the struggle. Don't make it hard. People have plenty to do getting their food ready. Don't need to struggle in front of them trying to carving it. Do it in the kitchen where it's fun. And here's my secret. Cook two turkeys. Trust me, everybody's going to love your turkey so much because you took the time to brine it and you took the time to do it right, that now they're going to gobble it up, excuse the pun, and then you're going to have one for carving and one for presentation. So you're actually presenting one, but you've already carved it. So you're not waiting for it to be carved. And then you save the other one for guess what? Yes, leftovers, that, that famous turkey sandwich for the next weekend. Good. Yeah, it does look I'm good. Hungry. I'm hungry. <laughs> so... That's how to cook the perfect turkey. And oh, and how do you smoke a turkey? <laughs> Yay. Yum. <laughs> All right. Hi, Renee. Yeah, we got one yum. Can we hear some more yum, yums? <laughs> yum or delicious or excellent. Now you want to get a yum yum. Great. Thank you. So you want to prepare the turkey for smoking the same way. So remember, if you don't want to smoke, you don't have to. I typically will smoke one and then roast one, so I have both kinds, and I'll save the one that I want for my sandwiches. Usually it's the smoked one. I'll save that one for later. But you want to prepare it the same way. You want to go ahead and brine it, build your fire in the meantime in your Smoky Joe, add your coals, and, and if you see, there's a pan underneath the bird. That pan has two inches of water, and the coals, which are nice and hot, are pushed off to the side so it's it's coals is around it not under it and then in the meantime you should have had some smoked chips some wood chips that you smoked overnight I mean excuse me soaked overnight in water and then you squeeze out the water you sprinkle them all around the uh, uh, the, the coals and that'll create this beautiful smoke and then adjust the vents so your bird is cooking at about 350 degrees and mm. cook till done, just yeah, like good. just like the other bird. So that is how to cook the perfect turkey. Here's the queen of sides, <laughs> Renee. It's all about the sides. Side, okay, side. so here's Renee's favorite mm. whipped potatoes. Go for it, Renee. Yes, actually, I did an event yesterday. Now, and I, the whipped potatoes that I made were with um, uh, chopped garlic, real cream, and uh, fresh Italian parsley, and of course salt and pepper. And um, uh, first, I'm going to tell you what potatoes I do use. It's, I usually use russet or Yukon gold, not Yukon, but Yukon gold. And what I do is I, I wash them very well in the alkaline water, 9.5 pH water. I quarter them. Sometimes I peel them, sometimes I don't. If it's the red potatoes, I don't normally um, uh, peel them because of the, of the skin is so delicious. So add a little salt in the water, drain, and then you get ready to whip. But before you whip them in another bowl, you have your blender ready, your mixer, I should say. And in that bowl, you should have um, butter already softened, uh, chopped roasted garlic. So what you do with the roasted garlic is you get a little frying pan, Put a little slab of butter, get the butter hot, chop, put the garlic in there that's already chopped fine. That's how you're roasting them. Maybe a little bit of rosemary if you want, chopped. Um, definitely some chopped parsley and 
um, and then you put salt and pepper in there as well as paprika. Then you take that mixture, put it in a bowl, and in that bowl you already have, uh, let's say, depending how many how many people, but you have your cream, sour cream, and um, added butter. Now, obviously, this is not Weight Watchers. It's not a Jenny Craig cup of mashed potatoes. It's Thanksgiving, so during the year you work out, you exercise, you eat well. And you eat green, you know, plant-based, but this is the holiday, so it's now time to celebrate your life. So put on the mashed potatoes. Don't use anything box. Um, whatever you do, another thing, just another helpful hint and tip, do not use a microwave. Um, I believe in old school microwaves kill any enzymes that you may have. So if you're going to reheat anything like mashed potatoes, put it in a pan, a little bit of water covered under low heat. Keep mixing it, and don't forget you have mashed potatoes on the stove or anything else that you're cooking to reheat. I don't, we don't even have a microwave in our in our kitchen, and um, it's much healthier. Our dogs don't even eat anything out of a microwave. So okay, add so uh, paprika, and we're complete with that. Next. Oh, and how do you hold the potatoes if you're making them in advance? Hold them in your hand. No. We'll oh, okay. Well, <laughs> okay, so you get it. You put it in your pan that goes into the oven, not your serving platter. You take the potatoes, wrap it with a little bit of plastic over it, not a little bit, but you wrap plastic over it, tin foil it, seal it tightly, stick it in the oven, and the plastic will not melt. And keep it at a low heat, let's say at 200 or 250. So while you're preparing um, the other items, your potatoes will come out of the oven hot and steamy. Great. And, and, and also, uh, Renee's going to go over this later, but we also, uh, uh, let's see, a picture would be nice here. There's a picture right there. Mashed potatoes. Yeah. Right there. And so we, we like putting our, uh, uh, setting up a buffet. So we, we don't like putting all the food on the table, but actually on a separate buffet. So if you have a chafing dish hot, you could also put your finished potatoes in there. They won't suffer staying in, in a, uh, a warm uh, chafing dish, and they'll, they'll last for, for an hour or so. So here's the next one. Ooh, this is one of my favorites. Roasted Brussels sprouts. Um, what I do is I, I uh, wash them and clean them, obviously, in the alkaline congen water. And um, sometimes if I don't have time to, to, um, to uh, what do you call it, to rinse them well, I just soak them in the alkaline water. Um, we have a little note from Kathy, and she puts them in a crock pot, and that's already warm. I think that's a brilliant idea. Uh, if you have extra crock pots, I only have one gigantic one, and usually I'll have very short ribs in there, but I should probably get another one just for mashed potatoes. Great idea, Kathy. So back to the Brussels sprouts. So I cut them in half, peel the outside leaves, and then I saute them in a little bit of olive oil or a little bit of olive oil and a little bit of real butter. So I saute them nicely so they're a little bit crisp. I add in some garlic that's already been um, sauteed with the uh, oil first. And then I add a little bit of chopped bacon if you want, or you can cook them in, in the bacon um, residue, take out the bacon, and then add that in later. Uh, you can also add grilled onions and almonds, which are slivered, and that makes a really delicious side dish of roasted Brussels sprouts. And one of the things I love about your Brussels sprouts is that just like this picture, they're seared beautifully, but they're not mushy. No, because they're only cooked for a few minutes. Um, the worst thing to do is overcook vegetables. Um, as I mentioned about the microwave, you do not want to cook, overcook vegetables in a pan because it takes out all of the nutrition as well. So on something like this, you want a little bit al dente, but not too much because they are Brussels sprouts. So if you want them a little bit um, al dente, you might want to quarter them, and that you can cook them even faster. Great idea. And I made them yesterday, and Renee Marlowe were, was there, and she tried it, and she said it was delicious. Just said so. <laughs> just, just said so, because it's Renee Merlot. <laughs> so here we go, cranberry sauce, another favorite, especially during the holiday season of Thanksgiving. Um, actually, I like, I like cranberries anytime. You can even eat it with chicken. But mm -hmm. um, making it old school, where you get a bag of cranberries, and then you boil them. But in that boiling water, you want to add cranberries, sugar, or honey. Now, I like to use special honeys. They have, um, at Sprouts, they have like eight or nine different types of honeys. Jalapeno honey, uh, regular honey. They had a blueberry honey, different things. So um, look and see. I always like to explore 
stores in their um, condiment section just to add to other things that I'm, I'm cooking as side dishes. Pinch of salt, orange juice, or I also add besides the orange juice is orange zest. Another note that you might want to add is amaretto to the cranberry. Uh, I'm sorry, Grand Marnier. Sorry, I got my booze mixed up. The Grand Marnier. <laughs> love Grand Marnier. And if, if people are um, can't drink uh, liquor or anything, you can always, always tell them that it is true that the liquor, the alcohol does burn off, but the residue of the flavoring still stays. Cinnamon stick, that's another thing you can get at Sprouts to add to that when you're boiling the water. You want to take out the cinnamon stick when you serve it, though, because you don't want anyone to crunch on that. So that is really delicious. I love that. Great sides. Yeah, yeah. delicious. Uh, oh, here's another one. Uh, kale and mushroom saute. Uh, with the kale, there's all types of different kales now. They have dinosaur kale, the curly kale, all sorts. You can add, you can create like two or three types of kale in one dish. Button mushrooms, shiitake. Mushrooms are good with this, both together. Um, garlic, olive oil, lemon juice, salt, and pepper. What you want to do is you want to saute the garlic first, and then uh, while that's sauteing, you want to do your mise en place, which is taking or preparing, I should say, everything ready, all your ingredients prepared. Your mushrooms cleaned, quartered, your garlic already chopped, as well as your kale, cutting it off the stem and leaving the stems. You can throw those away or use those later on in a broth and just stick them in bags in the freezer. All your vegetable ends you can stick them in the freezer and use them the remnants as um, part of a broth so um, so you want to take off stem off the kale chop them not fine but just in chunks and then um, you start with put olive oil in the pan let it get a little bit hot add your garlic chopped garlic add your kale add your mushroom saute that and then lemon juice and salt and pepper to taste and then you're done it's very simple very easy um, the other thing you might want to add as well is during the cooking process with all these things, you would, it's much better to have everything prepared in advance. So depending on how many people you have, if this is a small group, have this ready. Great. And one little pet peeve I want to share with you is says we, you have on there olive oil. I know because I know we, we do this uh, in, in the test kitchen is that we use olive oil for cooking, that's regular olive oil, and then extra or extra virgin olive oil for flavoring. So if you like olive oil, go ahead and cook with olive oil, but regular olive oil. It's less expensive, but also, why do you want to use something like extra virgin on, when it doesn't benefit you when you're cooking it? But it is great to add a little drop of extra virgin after you do this saute that way you get that olive oil flavor that you would miss if you sauteed it, if you actually use the high heat on it. Oh, exactly. Also, on your point, Jim, is on the EVVO, which is extra virgin olive oil, is it has a very high burning rate, so it's smoking, it's mm -hmm. smoking rate uh, when, the, when the heat is high. So you don't want to put EVVO on it. Exactly. All right. Great, I'm hungry. I don't know about you guys, but but the, the, it's like I'm I'm looking at these pictures. I'm saying like, oh man, what great combinations. So these are just ideas, but just to give you an idea, also some of the things that we did is going to relate in this. Manage your time to manage your overwhelm. So I'm going to talk about that, but before we do that, Renee's going to read you one of her hints and tips. Go ahead. Well, one of the hints and tips I have um, is having a housekeeper. If you're going to have more than 10, 15 people, it, it, and you plan this in advance, if this is all part of planning your timing as well as your budget. If you can budget a housekeeper to be there to clean the house before, to be there at, the, at your event, if you have 10 to 20 people or more, you definitely want a housekeeper not only to help you prep the house and your kitchen, but also to be doing dishes and um, busting the tables. That means taking the, the dishes, preferably not paper plates, but the dishes into the sink. The worst thing a hostess can make, host or hostess can make, is serving the delicious food when they're done bringing it to the sink and then washing the dishes while the guests are at the table doing nothing. The, they, your guests came to see you. They did not come to see you do dishes. So if, if somebody is 
over obsessed with you have to have the kitchen clean, you know, just leave them there or have a housekeeper do them or them hide them in the sink or put a towel over the whole thing. Perfect. Thank you, Renee. That was an excellent hint. Now we're going to get right into organization. This is probably the most important thing that you can do. I usually started it off, but I wanted to kind of get you get your appetites wet. Now to get to all that delicious food, you need to make a menu. Your menu is the most important thing. In fact, without a menu, it's kind of like going in a, a, a ship and uh, without, a, without a wheel, you know, you have no idea how, how to get someplace because you have no direction. It's your so GPS. It's your GPS, exactly. And you have to have a rough timetable. Don't just make up uh, times and not have an idea what you're doing. Uh, it's all about having a menu for your guideline, your GPS, having a timetable, and then write it down. I tell you, it is the most important thing. When, uh, when you're in a professional kitchen, you always look in the wall and you see this little prep list on the wall. That prep list keeps everybody going because without having that prep list, you don't know where you are. And I'm a, I'm a big proponent of writing things down. You can see here, here's a, here's a typical Thanksgiving Day menu. Now, uh, I don't know if you noticed, one of the hints and tips that Renee has is uh, greet your guests with, on arrival with, uh, with, with soup. And I have down here lobster bisque shooters. Now, I'm not going to talk about lobster bisque today, but any type of soup, when people come in the door, and this is a great idea, have a little shot glass uh, or a small cup that has a little soup. It is something unusual and different, but soup is a very satisfying dish. So if somebody comes in, they're really hungry, and you give them a little soup right at the beginning. It's going to curb that appetite, and especially if you're serving cocktails, it kind of gives them a little something in their tummy so they're not drinking on an empty stomach. I don't like filling people up with bread and, and doughy things. What do you think, Renee? No, because they ruin their appetite. It's just like going to a buffet. Um, at a restaurant, you don't want to fill up on all the carbs, you know, the bread and and the rice and and macaroni. You want to eat like the seafood or the the, the proteins, you know, the turkey and the prime rib and things like that. So you or, can see. Oh, I'm or, sorry. And vegetables. Yeah, no, I'm complete. Okay, so you can see right here on this menu how everything is laid out. Where you look at the menu and just like what Renee was talking about with her her side dishes, the side dishes don't take a long time, but there are things that can be done in advance and some things get done in the last minute. Now, guess what? The turkey, which is the main, uh, the main item that's going to be showing off uh, for everybody that day, that's the most important thing. That one gets out of the oven at least an hour before the guests come. That way, you can have it sitting to the side resting. And we usually have an oven that's, uh, that's a warm oven, and I sometimes will put things in there the turkey I'll put on the counter near the oven with a little tent. And while you're doing that, guess what? Now is the time to do the things that Renee was talking about, finishing up on the uh, sautéed uh, kale with the mushrooms. Uh, the cranberry sauce was done the day before, right? Yeah, you can do a lot of side dishes that I recommend is always doing the day before because if you're one person in the kitchen and you've got to do all this stuff, setting the table, doing all the side dishes, doing the main entree, Yes, you can do it as long as you can do it the day before. And right. it is very helpful, especially if you have only one oven. You might want to do a lot of this ahead of time and then refrigerate it and then heat it up on a pan in a pot later on when people are there. Yeah, and, you, and your whipped potatoes, you do a couple of hours in advance, right? Because you can hold those. You can hold those. Especially now we know how to hold them, uh, Kathy said, in the uh, crock pot. In the crock pot. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Good idea. Great idea. Uh, so there's your menu, and that should be on your refrigerator door or someplace nearby where you can always refer to it because I can't tell you how many times we forget that one thing in the refrigerator like the cranberry relish. Exactly. So this is an actual outline that I do. I know I'm a little bit crazy there, but think about it. If you're going to do it, do it right. Give yourself time it says, to, to shop. Don't be that person who goes in saying, calling up the grocery store and saying, are you open the day of? And then you're doing your main shopping. And by the way, a frozen turkey takes a long time to defrost. Do not get one the day before expecting it to be ready. How long does it take? Three or four days? Three or four days in the frost? refrigerator. And yes. you want to do it in the refrigerator. Do never, ever put a turkey in warm water to defrost it. You're asking for trouble. It may defrost, but what's going to happen is 
that's that's like a surefire way of getting salmonella and and any type of foodborne disease but that's a big no-no so you can see in the planning and and by the way it says we're going to give you an opportunity at the end of this call where you can get your own and we're not selling anything today yay this is all just instruction but if you want to have this just send us a notice later on and by email we'll give that to you and you can get all of these notes for yourself but notice how you can do as many things as possible in advance to save time so you're not crazy the day of, of Thanksgiving or, the, or any type of day you're going to be entertaining. So simplify your preparation. I can't tell you how people, I mean, I mean isn't that crazy? Like when we talk about never try something new on a oh day of God. an event. No, not, not a day of Thanksgiving or Christmas. You do not want to try a new recipe. No. Uh, it's dangerous and it may take longer, uh, it's harder to find ingredients, and then adds extra stress. And that's how people go crazy in the parking lot because they've got stress from family, stress from a new recipe, and they have no idea why they're doing this. So it creates drama. Yeah. You don't want that. Yeah. And another thing, a little hint, it says another reason why you want to plan and, and like I said, you want to have a timetable like this one right here because. We don't even travel a day of Thanksgiving, and sometimes the day before we minimize our travel, especially in, in uh, Southern California, people are crazy. Any type of holiday, you got to be careful because people are in a hurry and they're driving unconsciously, and this is no joke. When you're driving around, it says you take your life in your own hands around holidays, and the closer we get to Christmas, the crazier it gets. So. Planning ahead is going to make your life so much. Can I interject another simplifying the preparation Absolutely. for the kitchen? Here's another hint for the for the kitchen is um, since you're going to be having a lot of people, let's say 10 or 15 people or 18 people, which to me is is sort of on the small end, but it's definitely uh, doable. Make sure you have zero things on the counter. No toasters, no blenders, no can openers. Try to have all that stuff cleared and put under the cabinet or put into another room. So all your counters are literally clear. No bread boxes, nothing, because it just adds a lot of clutter. If you see that it's open and wide, that means, yay, you have freedom to do what you want without having to subconsciously see the clutter. It's like, what else do I have to do next? So it just streamlines, streamlines your kitchen, especially when people come in, because that is the happiest place in the home, is the kitchen. So when people are putting their drinks down there and they're putting it around a bread box or around a blender that you're not using or any of this equipment stuff, except your condom water machine always has to be in the middle, of course. But other than that, just your condom water appliance in the center on stage, but everything else, put it underneath the cabinets. Great tip. I love that. And by the way, these tips are not written down here, but we will include Renee's list of hints and tips for the holidays in, in addition to this uh, presentation. So a little something about cleanliness, so important. I mean, your guests are coming over and, and they wanna have a great time, but they also wanna have a great day later on. And you don't wanna have somebody call you up and say, yeah, thanks a lot for that dinner. I was sick all day long and I couldn't go shopping. So we wanna make sure that uh, you, 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 you do little things like washing your hands frequently or rubber gloves or the latex gloves are really when you're working with uh, uncooked meats and fish. Te especially be aware of cross-contamination. Do not assume that that one cutting board you have is going, to, is going to be clean with a little soap and water. I have a wooden cutting board that I use in the kitchen and wood is the best medium for cutting on, but if you have plastic, just make sure you clean it really well Use one side for raw, the other side for cooked. So that way there's no cross-contamination. If you have multiple cutting boards, that's, do, that's even better. And colored ones. If you have colored ones, then there's more distance. Oh, that's even better. That's yeah. getting, and now we're getting real fancy. So. It's called OCD. <laughs> yes. Oh, and a big, big cutting board, like a like 25 by 30 inch cutting board would be good. And then wash your produce thoroughly. I can't tell you, it's a, a, a lot of the people on the call who, own Kangen machines and and know the power of the of the water that is given. It says it's like having the 11.5 pH water, that strong Kangen water is fantastic. We're so lucky and so blessed to have have uh, that as a way to wash our vegetables. But do do 
take the time to wash all your vegetables and have them ready uh, when you need them. And defrost slowly in the refrigeration. It's a planning goes a long way, especially for large pieces of meat like a turkey. And then, and then this goes for all other things that you do throughout the holidays. You know, if you're going to do like shrimp cocktail during a, a Christmas party, don't wait till the last moment to defrost those, uh, those uh, shellfish. Do it in advance. And they're actually, the meat will actually be better. If you try to rush a defrost, it actually bursts the cells of the meat and those cells release moisture and then when you cook dry it's going to dry out and nobody likes that so and then uh last but not least acceptable convenience i can't tell you how many times that uh, we're in a hurry and it says i i i'm so thankful that i had a little bag of frozen peas, peas yeah. <laughs> it's, <have> to <laughs> it's like sometimes you know you got to look at that cost to time ratio what's going to save you time and effort and if Making puff pastry is your thing, and you want to show off that you know how to make puff pastry, great. I'll go ahead and buy my puff pastry already made, and when I need it, I just pull it out of the freezer. It takes a couple of minutes literally to defrost. I can put together an apple tart in like 30 minutes or less just because I have the uh, the ingredients on hand. So it's it's easy to do. Yeah. Hey, can we throw in a helpful hint about visiting people? Go for it. Because we're talking about... Everybody coming over to your house. Let's say you're invited to five or six parties or ten parties in the holiday season. This is just a helpful tip: is that if you go to the if you go to a wine store, um, buy uh, you know a six pack, a six 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 bottles of wine or twelve bottles of wine, knowing you're going to be going to people's homes, and not buy the, the two buck chuck, which is Charles Shaw, which is two ninety nine. If anyone would ever bring it to our house, to my house. It would be like they're definitely crossed off the list. The reason why I'm saying under a $5 bottle of wine is not only is it an insult to the host or hostess, is that they're putting in more than $5 per person in food and in preparation and their time to make you a really delicious dinner. So in respect to the host and hostess, buy like an $8, $12, $15, $18 dollar bottle of wine, which would be nice. If you can't do the $18, which I understand everyone's on a budget, during the holiday season, you know, an $8 to $10 bottle would be very uh, appreciative. And if you can have them wrapped with a bow or in the bags already at your front closet, so when you're ready to walk out the door, you grab and go instead of saying, oh, let me go to the store with all the other crazy people. And to buy one bottle is not a feasible thing for your time, what you make per hour. So I just thought I'd, I'd share that. Great hint. And, and, you know, oh, well, I know you, this. Well, you know what? Okay, one more thing. Yeah, yeah. Okay, would you mind if I go complete? Ahead, go, go. If your host or hostess do not drink, which most people, you know, have a little wine, you can always get like a few boxes of candy. Um, at Seas Candy, they keep, you know, the one pound box. It's not that expensive, maybe twelve dollars. Have them ready to wrap. And everyone loves chocolate, so Seas Candy, Nuts and Chews, or whatever it is that you think that they would like. But buy four or five because if you're going to go to parties, you want to have something already pre-wrapped, ready to walk out the door. I'm Great hands. Thank you. Okay, so uh, just to add to the the wine part that you're talking about, uh, show your wines the day before. I can't tell you how many times people forget. And even in the professional restaurant business, we would always make sure that when we had a, we were setting up for an, uh, an event for the next day, just stick that stuff in the refrigerator. Your beer, your wine, stick it in the refrigerator. So now it's done. It's it's complete. And so that little tiny hint should help a lot. And, then, and and before I go on, just want to make sure now, I know we had all the yummy food we started with and the, this middle part's a little bit of the organization, which sometimes is not as sexy, but is this stuff interesting for you? I mean, are you getting something out of it? If you are, say, heck yeah. Or hell yeah. <laughs> so just is it, is send us even, a little little no, uh, no. little note saying that you that this is interesting and you're getting something out of it. Or they can text. You want me to be using no, it? No, just a, a, on, the the, chat, yeah. on the chat room. Yeah, okay. That's fine. So somebody can chat us. Yay. Yeah, yes, definitely. definitely. Thank okay. you, Maureen. Great. Okay, perfect. Should I go with some more hints and tips? Just to go ahead and, and uh, if I hadn't mentioned it earlier, make sure your knives are sharp. If there's one thing that, that's most dangerous thing in the kitchen is a dull knife, and a dull sense of humor, ba boom boom. Uh -huh. uh -huh. <laughs> uh, be cool, meaning when you're when you get everything ready and you're set, 
you're cool as a cucumber, and that's the best way to be, especially around sharp knives. And then last, don't fry turkeys. And if you need to know what I mean by that, just here's a great illustration right here. Don't fry turkeys. That's all I got to say about that. If you want to know more about it, you can call me personally and ask me about that. But I think that picture is self-explanatory. So we're going to go into what Renee does best, and that's create the atmosphere. Okay. So I'm going to work a little bit backwards. Um, let's say your dinner is at 6 o'clock. What you want to do is have everything complete. If you can set the table like a few days before uh, you have people over, like if you have people on Thursday, you might want to set the table on Monday or Tuesday, only so you can get all the, the platters, the plates, everything's washed clean. Uh, your wine glasses are out, but you can turn them upside down if you want, or put the napkins in the glasses, but have your chargers, your placemats, everything done, maybe even your place cards, depending who the people are. And it is kind of nice to have place cards. Have your buffet table cleared off, your buffet dishes out with the serving utensils. So when people come the day of, you're not going crazy. Where is this? Where is that? Can you help me go up in this cabinet? Blah, 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 blah. It will make your life really smooth, really simple. So let's say your dinner is at 6. You want to be complete with everything except for last minute things like putting on salad dressing on the salad. You do not want to be doing a salad when people walk in. It is the worst thing. The reason why is when people walk into your kitchen, you are already on stage. They don't want to see your back or your back of your head as you're going into the refrigerator getting a, a head of lettuce and throwing it out in the bag into a bowl. Everything should be complete as we call it the mise en place, which is the preparation. When people walk into your kitchen, like I said earlier, counters should be clear. You should have everything done by 4.30 so when people come in at 6, it's done. So in that time of that 4.30 period, you can hug your husband, you can kiss your husband, you can kiss your kids, just showing them gratitude that you love them and you care for them. You take a shower, do your makeup, um, pick out the right outfit, have your music already selected, you can be lighting your candles. Another thing you can do to create the atmosphere is garlic and rosemary sauteed in a pan so it creates more of a ambiance in the in your home. Wait, just, wait, wait, I gotta hear that again. So, okay, so everybody, go. this is a great this is a great hint. So write this down if you didn't hear this one, because Renee goes really fast and this is like a this one is a, a, a doozy. A, it's a doozy. a doozy. Go for it. A doozy. So you get a regular frying pan, not the iron pan, but a regular saute pan, Teflon pan. You chop up some rosemary or you uh, if you have a, something in your backyard or if you have something in your shelf, that's fine too. But it's rosemary and garlic. Maybe you could throw some onion in. Put a little bit of oil. Have it hot. Throw the garlic. Throw the rosemary. It starts smoking. Then you take it off. Shut off the fire. Go around the house. Let's say if it's 6 o'clock is your dinner. By 5.45, you're walking around the house with this frying pan. And it's setting all the fragrance in the house. Also at that time. Wait, 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 wait. So everybody, if you didn't get that. What Renee just told you is like gold. We did this in a restaurant business. We would have the carpets cleaned, and nobody wants to smell that 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 cleaning chemical, chemical smell. And this was where it, we we came up with this was how do we cover this up with, that doesn't smell artificial? And 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 I tell you, guaranteed, when you go ahead and walk around the house with garlic and sauté garlic is one of the most beautiful, or garlic and rosemary, one of the most it's beautiful natural. smells. It's natural. And this is what gets people's appetite going. Great. I love that hint. That's one of my favorites. So um, as Jim had on his um, Excel file about the planning, you want to plan in that hour and a half at 4.30 to have everything complete. At quarter 5.30, quarter to 6, right around there, you want to have your music on so it's selected, whether it's classical music or a live, you know, like smooth jazz or something low in, in the back. You want to have your candles lit. Uh, one of the things that... I have a pet peeve about is that hostesses will put these candles on the table, oh, but we don't want to light them. It's like it's like having a couch where you have plastic over it. No, you can't sit there because it's the good couch. You want to take off that plastic off the couch. You want to light the candles, whatever candles you have on the table, light them. Don't have them there for decoration. They're to be used, not to be looked at a, thing, a stick of wax. So just because some people get like that, oh, I can't light the candles. Um, another thing is you know, like have your outfit that you're going to be wearing, have, you get your makeup showered, your favorite perfume, and be ready to greet your guests with a big hug. Um, 
if you're stressed out and you're seeing your family that you haven't seen in a long time or there's there's chaos or drama within the family, shake that off because it's empty and meaningless. It is from the past. You're in the present. A good way I found to do this is not only just having a martini, but literally jumping up and down in your bathroom so that you can just take off this ickiness that you may have. Let's talk about tablescapes. This is one of the tablescapes I've done. Um, as you can see, the, the, the blue turquoise is remnants from Joanne's Fabrics or one of the fabric stores. The, the, the antique on the top is something that I had found in my storage. All I did was add Oasis to the top of that ornament. Oasis is a foam that you line the container with plastic or so, like cellophane. Then you put the Oasis in top and then you just get flowers from the market. Super simple. But then also the draping of the, the table covering, that fabric that you have, the overlays, that's just also extra remnants. Now, you get this during the year instead of doing something last minute. One of the things I did for a huge New Year's Eve party several years ago, the client didn't have anything. They literally, he's a bachelor, didn't have anything. But he cooked a little bit. He was, with, he liked Asian women. So what he had in his garage was a bunch of these rice steamers. Uh, it's the rice steamers that they're made out of wood. So I said, is this all you have? And he said, yes. So I turned them upside down. I used them. I doubled up. I had my glue gun, which I trust. Um, glued some together, had the open, open ends up. I got plastic liners from his kitchen, you know, the cellophane, saran wrap. And then I put the oasis. I stuck flowers that I got from his garden and from the neighbors next door. So, because he didn't have any flowers. So what you're saying is, don't worry. If you don't have everything, use what you got. Like this time of year, you have what? You have Poinsettia, pumpkins and... Poinsettias, and, squash, butternut squash, um, acorns, and things like that. And horn of plenty. This is... Oh, show the red one again. This is one of my favorites. This was a Valentine's Day, um, a Valentine's Day celebration. And um, the two the two men and women is I got that someplace a long time ago. It's vintage. I got it at an antique auction of some sort, as well as the other things. So the tablecloth again is a remnant. And then on the back, I have pillows made out of uh, roses that I made out of ribbons. So that I know there's a lot of little details, but I save a lot of stuff in my garage. My garage, forget about it. Ken knows he's been to our garage. He's seen a plethora of stuff that I have. But it, I use them. Um, this is a little way of doing a display of desserts that I've done um, with different uh, mousses and puddings and things like that. So you want the variation of high and low, not straight across because that's boring. You want the plateau of up and down. It makes the eye go around the table and more interesting to look at. I love it. I love it. So basically, this time of the year, you would you would just I mean, sometimes people like you have like statues and stuff, but you can get stuff like fresh stuff like uh, for your table from the from the produce market. Well, from the farmers market, you yeah. know, if you have a uh, a farmers market that you like to go to, even if you don't know how to make squash, just put it on your table. If you live near a forest or you're going to go travel to the forest with your family or you're going to a park, you see an acorn. Take the acorn. Make sure that it doesn't have any termites on. Horns. And that's a great way to just for cheap, inexpensive decoration, but it creates the flair of autumn. Um, another thing to do too is autumn leaves. You can find those at like a Ralph's Market or a Pavilions. These are orange and red leaves that you can get for your tablescape and put the acorns on top. Wow. Well, this is all awesome stuff. You could do a whole class just on tablescapes, but you know, with the time that we have, as I thought, a little taste of tablescapes was good enough but as you can see presentation is so important so what we're going to do right now and it, it, we're, we're we're ready for Q&A so uh, I know you must have some questions but while you're getting your questions ready we're going to go ahead and give you a couple of more of Renee's hints and tips because I think they're awful uh, important uh, one of the uh, one of the ones that uh, she mentions is have like a, a butler's table is that what you call it I call it a butler's table a butler's table especially if you're just you and your husband are just two, you're, you're a couple and there's like six other couples. Instead of you getting up and down as a hostess, oh, I forgot the fork, oh, we have to do the dessert, and get up and down to put the dessert plates and blah, blah, blah. You want to have your small plates or your dessert plates, your coffee cups and the saucers, coffee kind of already made maybe in a thermos, and your coffee service, which means 
you're creaming your sugar in in containers already. Uh, maybe the cream in the creamer, so all you have to do is have it on ice at the, in the dining room area or in their buffet area. Uh, let's see. So there's that. The well, I also when, when, since since oh, one of my you. specialties is is team building, I always like to enlist people. Uh, every every time you have guests come over, have little jobs ready for people who always want to ask, "Can I help?" And I know sometimes we all tend to say, "No, no, no, I'm fine." But sometimes they really do want to help. And I always find the outgoing guest, the person who likes to chat and, and move around and stuff, and I give them a, a, an idea to play host or hostess. And when people come in, I say, here, why don't you get, uh, have this tray of champagne? When people come in, can you go ahead and give it to them? They love that. So yeah. it's awesome. Yeah, they love. certain people love to be of service, and so they won't be chatting so much to you while you're focusing on stuff in the kitchen. Well, I got, I got a first uh, text on... Uh, on how to make gravy, and I know I didn't talk about it uh, today because uh, it, it, it's a little bit more time-consuming. And and I'm going to give you I'm going to give you the quick answer and the uh, not so quick answer. So both of them taste good, but here's my here's my uh, uh, it's actually a three answers to this one question. The first one, of course, you could do what everybody does and get that can of gravy that they have at the store. Boring. Mm -hmm. So this is what we do. We go ahead and we still get that can of gravy, but we now mock it up. And when I say mock it up, I mean when you roast those vegetables in the oven and you get those juices from the, the turkey that come out, don't throw them away. In fact, what I do is when I take the turkey off of the vegetables that cooked that was underneath it, I go ahead and, and add a little uh, white wine to the pan and I leave it in the oven without the turkey being on it and, and then scrape up the pan because a lot of the good goodness from the turkey drips down. Now that right there, you can dump that in a, in a, uh, a turkey uh, gravy mixture and add a little congan water to thin it down because I always think they make those gravies too thick. And what's going to happen is you get a chance to simmer, you'll get a lot of the flavor, the natural flavors from the turkey just by doing that. It's amazing what happens. And then strain it afterwards so it has that nice smooth texture to it. That's that's one. The second one is is to go ahead and do this as I mentioned. But what you want to do is maybe get a uh, uh, use a a, a package good quality uh, stock, and you can get frozen stock from uh, surface restaurant supply. So they'll already have like veal stock or chicken stock already made and frozen. So it's just like if you made it fresh. And you add that to all that stuff that I told you, all the, all the uh, stuff from the, from the pan. And then that will be the basis of your sauce. And then last but not least, much more involved, but to make it from uh, scratch, making a stock, or as people uh, popularly call it, bone broth, and make a gravy from that. So did you have another question there, Renee? Well, let me press um, the cam camera and so that we can right here. Oh, okay. Can you turn that on and okay. see everybody? Well, we can't see them, but they can oh, see us. In the meantime, I have uh, a few emails that came in. Oh, can okay. Go ahead. Yeah. So, um, so Sally from um, Beverly Hills, or actually she's from Orange County uh, in Irvine. She asked what type of things or what type of, of fall things to make uh, during this season. What's I guess what she's asking is what's in season mm -hmm. and what to make. So I say... Uh, squash, butternut squash mm. is a good thing to make. Mm -hmm. uh, roast it. Sometimes I put a little bit of brown sugar. Not always, but sometimes. Uh, yams are always great. It's a, always year round. And uh, kale uh, and root vegetables like turnips and beets are delicious. Root vegetables that you roast with a little bit of olive oil and salt and pepper. Mix it and put it in the oven for about 40 minutes or so. So mm -hmm. it's a little bit tender and you're ready to go. But well, we do it a little bit different. How do we do it? We serve it. Oh, that's right. We serve it. Yeah. For your free ebook, just go ahead and send us uh, a, you know, a quick uh, email for a cooking class at ceochef.com and we'll send off a, uh, a PDF of the uh, ebook. And then uh, thank you. Uh, we, we want to wish everybody a, a wonderful holiday. We do this once a year just as a way of saying thank you to the people. Uh, 
just people who we work with, our, our clients, our friends, family, and we uh, we hope that this makes your life a little bit easier, right? It's easy and stress-free. Yes. It's easy breezy. Yes, organizing your life will become stress-free. So with that being said, thank you so much. Uh, we will uh, post the uh, recording uh, when it's uh, complete, and then uh, we'll uh, you, you'll have something to refer to later on, and hopefully you have as much fun as we do. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Bye.